let's make a platformer. We are now ready to build the advanced movement of our player. In simple games, we might write our player movement and animation code right here inside the update function. But because I know the code is going to be long, and now that you understand custom functions from our map collision, we can better organize our code by writing them as custom functions elsewhere and just refer to them here. So first we will want to have a player update function that will handle the movement and also a player animate function that will obviously handle the animation. We don't need to pass any variables to these functions, so empty parentheses are fine. And the code inside these functions will run the same way every time as if the code was written right here. And that's important to understand. Our player update code might be 100 lines long, and our player animate code might be another 20 lines long. And even though they will be written elsewhere, this main update function is going to read all of those lines of code in order as if they were written right here. So it will first run player update function by running all 100 lines of its code before it runs player animates 20 lines of code. And our main update function stays clean. Also, as long as we name our functions well, then it's easy to read what our code is doing. Now, let's make another tab just for the player functions. We start with function, then the name, and empty parentheses here too, because it shouldn't expect to get any variables. Now the first thing we should do is apply physics to our character. Gravity is easy. Just take the player dy and add gravity to it. Then take the player dx and multiply it by the friction. That might look like we are increasing the player movement, when friction is supposed to slow it down, but if you look back at our friction variable, it's a decimal that's less than one. And when we multiply something by a number less than one, we actually decrease it. So friction here is slowing the player down. In simple movement, we directly change the player x and y, but here we are only affecting dx and dy instead. Here's why. First, just to cover the basics, Increasing x moves the player to the right, decreasing x moves the player to the left. Increasing y moves the player down, and decreasing y moves the player up. Now dx and dy are how much the x and y will change each time. If they are positive numbers, then they will increase x or y. If they are negative numbers, then they will decrease x or y. Let's first look at what the gravity is doing to dy frame by frame. So gravity is set to 0.3, a very small number, but every frame we will add 0.3 to whatever the dy already is. Let's say the dy is zero, which means the player is not falling or jumping. On the first frame, dy will be increased to 0.3, and that will be added to the player's y. So the player only moves a tiny amount down. In fact, they won't actually move because it's not even one pixel change. But the next frame, dy is increased by another 0.3, so it's at 0.6. And again, 0.9. And again, 1.2. And now the player will fall more than one pixel every frame. In a couple more frames, the player will be falling by two pixels and they will keep falling faster and faster until we use max dy to limit the falling speed. dx will be used the exact same way when we make the character run, but instead of moving at the same speed all the time, like in simple movement, this advanced movement is more realistic because the speed builds up over time. It even means we don't immediately stop either. If we were running to the right, we build up our dx a lot like momentum, and if we let go of button right, the player is still carried further by dx. And if we don't have friction to slow it down, dx will constantly push the player on forever. So we use friction to cut back the dx little by little. And now if we move right, but then stop pushing button right, the player will slow down little by little thanks to friction. To understand the math behind it even more, just follow the link in the description to nerdyteachers.com. Let's move on and write the controls. If button left, then player dx decreases by acceleration. 
Just like gravity is how much we increase dy, acceleration is how much we increase dx. Positive for moving right, negative for moving left. Now, since we know the player is moving, we can set the movement status here too. Player.running is true. Also, because we drew our player character facing right, then when they move left, we need to flip the sprite, so let's turn player flip to true. Next, if button right, then player dx is increased by acceleration, and running is true. And make sure flip is false so the player faces right again. Now we can move left or right, and here's an easy way to add our slide. We'll just check if the player is running, and we're not pressing button left, and not pressing button right, and not falling, and not jumping. Then running is now false, but sliding is true. Next, let's do the jump, but there's a couple things to watch out for. First, we don't want the player to hold down the jump button, or maybe we do, because some games let you control how high you jump based on how long you hold the button. So if you want that, let us know in the comments, but for now, we'll keep this a little simpler. So to make sure the button is pressed only once to trigger the jump, we use BTNP instead of just BTN. BTNP stands for button press. So we check if button press X, and we want to make sure that the player is actually standing on something to be able to jump, because we don't want him to jump when he's in the air. Or maybe we do. You know those games with double jump, but not this time. So we just also make sure that the player has landed. Now, to create the player jump, we just take the player's dy and subtract the boost amount we already set. And since the player has left the ground, we change player landed to false. Now we can change the player x by the dx and change the player y by the dy. But what about collision? Well, in simple movement, I would just check collision up here at the button presses so you can't move if you're hitting a wall. But with this setup, we're going to check collision in between the controls and the actual movement. First, let's check collision on the y-axis up and down. If player dy is more than zero, then that means the player is falling and not landed and not jumping, unless the player hits the ground. So we get to use our collide map function. If collide map parentheses, but we need to give it more information. So let's go check what variables we need to pass it. First is a game object, which is a table that needs these keys and our player variable is a table that has those keys. So we first pass the whole player table and separate the variables with a comma. The second variable it needs is aim, and that is left, right, up, or down. And since we are checking for the player falling and hitting the ground, then we'll tell it to check down. The last variable it needs is a flag number, so we just have to remember which flag we use to mean cannot fall through, and that was flag zero. Now our collide map function will do its thing and come back as true or false. So that's the whole check. All right, so if it's true and the player does collide with the map, then the player has landed and is not falling anymore and the ground stops the falling momentum dy. But this check isn't always perfect and it will sometimes stop the player too late and he'll get stuck partway in the ground. So this code just makes sure the player is set just above the ground tile. It'll be explained at nerdyteachers.com. Next is if the player is moving upwards, which means the dy would be a negative number, which is less than zero. And if that is true, then jumping is true. And we check if collide map, player going up, and our flag for ceiling tiles, which is one, then we just kill the momentum and let gravity take over to start the fall. Finally, we check collision left and right. If player dx is less than zero, then that means we're moving left. And instead of using another flag, let's just reuse flag one to also mean cannot run through. Then we just kill the dx momentum. Now, if the player is not moving left, then they might be moving right. So we write else if player dx is more than zero, 
then they're moving right. And again, check collision to the right, and kill momentum. One more thing here. The player might be sliding, so we just need to know when to stop sliding. Let's just write it quickly here, and it'll be explained on the lesson page. Link in the description, nerdyteachers.com. Let's check it out so far, just to make sure everything's working. We just need to comment out the player animate function because we didn't write it yet, and so it would have erred on us. Of course, it looks pretty stupid with no animation happening, but the controls are feeling good. All right, it's animation time. This is pretty straightforward, so it'll be fast. Remember, this function should be player underscore animate, just because we named it earlier. Then empty parentheses. Now this is as simple as checking what type of movement the player is doing and setting the player sprite number to the correct sprite number doing that action. So if the player is jumping, then the player sprite should be seven. Else, if the player is falling, then it should be eight. Else, if the player is sliding, then it should be nine. And let's just double check those numbers in the sprite editor. Jumping is 7, falling is 8, and sliding is 9. Next is if the player is running. And now we're going to cycle through the multiple running sprites and control the animation speed. To understand what we are doing here and how we are controlling the animation timing, check out our other video, How to Animate a Sprite. It uses a little frog as an example. If all of those movement types are false, then we want to do something else. The player must not be moving, and another word for that is idle, so we'll leave ourselves a comment. And we write another animation code, since our idle pose has multiple sprites breathing in and out. These two numbers, point 0.1 and point 0.3, are our animation times, so you can play with those if you want. Let's check our game. This is awesome. It took quite a bit of preparation to get here, but this looks and feels fantastic. I think the last thing we need to do for the movement is limit the speed. We can use a cool function in Pico 8 called mid, and that will find the middle number of a list of numbers. So we can give it a maximum number in the negatives, and the speed we want to limit, and the same maximum number in the positives, and if our speed goes past either positive or negative max, then the max will be the middle number, and we just reset our speed to that. It's just one line, but I'll make it a function so it reads better than mid. We'll call this function limit speed, and we only need to give it a number and a maximum and this function will return whatever mid returns. That means we can just go up to our player movement code and find where the player is moving down so we can limit the falling speed. Now we can use it to set the player dy to what is returned by limit speed after it compares the current dy with the max dy. And then we do this again, but for the dx moving left, and again, moving right. All right, let's see how this turned out. Awesome. That's it for the player movement. Have fun running around and jumping on your map, but in the next video, we're going to extend the map so that it's a full level and add a camera that will follow the player around on the map. If you have any questions, leave it in the comments. And by subscribing, you're telling us you want more.